Okay, so we've heard that we have a lot in common with Australia and uh, the collective challenges our industries face. Uh, now I'd like to shift focus a little and uh, get back to something we started on, um, on, on uh, Thursday. Geez, that was just yesterday, and that's film. So, you know, during this conference, right, we've spent a lot of time talking about the growing crisis in, in film, both in the development, production, distribution, and marketing of Canadian theatrical productions. And, you know, we are not alone. I was just talking to uh, Will Evans um, at, at lunchtime, and uh, we were listening to Matthew, right? And he was saying the problems that everybody is having, uh, making anything from a 10 to $30 million movie and how incredibly difficult it is now to finance that, even though those are the kind of movies that have um, collectively probably won the uh, most number of uh, Academy Awards and awards in other countries. So the British Film Institute, like Telefilm Canada, is mandated to support local films. And like Telefilm, uh, the Institute is increasingly focused on optimizing uh, their financial resources with a view to promoting as much success as possible. And that, you know, uh, that's, that is a, a world reality. I know uh, Sandra's going to talk about that. Um, so just before I, I introduce the panel, uh, one of the things uh, Will mentioned to me is uh, um, that you know, the London Film Festival put on by BFI is uh, happening in October. And I said, you know, so you could, go to the Lo you could go to the London Film Institute, or maybe it works this way. If you go to MIPCOM first, come back, drop in in London, okay? and even if it's a little London, a little rainy, you know, fire yourself off to the West Coast to a little uh, bit of uh, AFM. Then you got enough time to jump across the ocean, go to Melbourne for uh, the producer's um, um, uh, bash that we're going we're gonna to be doing in Melbourne in uh, November. And if you get on the plane and get back quickly enough to Vancouver, you'll be able to make it up for the Whistler Film Festival. So I got my fall figured out. This is really good. I just don't know like what the people in Australia are going to do when I show up in Melbourne with my ski boots, you know. But anyways, so I'd now like to introduce a renowned, renowned Canadian theatrical film producer, Sandra Cunningham, one of my favorite people. Sandra's from Strata Films, and we're going to find out what our British colleagues are up to in conversation with Will Evans, Director of Business Affairs at the British Film Institute. So come on up, guys. And uh, first of all, Will, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> no, thank you um, very much. Thank you. We thought about him wearing a wig, but we thought there were so many extraordinary women in this room and at this conference, so take a moment to acknowledge the exceptional women in your lives and in this room. <laughs> there are many. And a particular... A particular congratulations to one Pamela Dinsmore, who's been acknowledged today as one of the recipients of the uh, Canadian Women in Communications Awards. And in the primetime scene, she really stood her, held her own under fire yesterday on her all-male panel. So congratulations, Pamela. Now, I was reading this morning that apparently the best place to be a female billionaire is China, and the best place to study, be a female engineer, is Estonia. Uh, but on today's theme, if Lynn Ramsey, Andrea Arnold, and Philippa Lloyd are any test, being in the UK and being a female film director is not so bad either. Uh, and we have here Will Evans, who is, is responsible for, in part, part of a team responsible for implementing a very new policy uh, at the BFI, the British Film Institute in the UK, that is part of a plan that I think has the best name ever. It's called Film Forever. Now, how's that for an agency looking forward to support film? And it's going to run from, it's a plan that was that's being implemented now from 2012 to 2017. So we, it's a great privilege for us to have Will here to talk about something that is just at the beginning of its uh, implementation. And they did an 18-month study that was very expansive around the industry, consulting with an awful, a whole number of players, all of the partners we, you know, we see here in this room for our country. 
and have come up with some pretty interesting observation about where film's at and uh, where it might go and how public and private resources can come together to help uh, harness that. And before, and we'll, we'll, I, you've probably all read your notes, but it's interesting because like in Canada, people who are in strong public policy positions often benefit from having been out in the field. And, and uh, Will has legal training. He's worked at both EMI and at the uh, famous Polygram Filmed Entertainment. So he's been out and he knows what it's like for independent producers out in the field. So before we get into the actual, what, what the BFI is launching in terms of film development, production, and distribution, You've been here since Tuesday, and uh, Will acknowledged that he's been to Canada once before at the age of? 17. 17, and he went to Niagara Falls. So this is the first time to Ottawa, and he's been here since Tuesday. I wanted to ask you, is there anything that in the last three days, that as we come to this final, final day here, that you notice either that we have very much in common with you in the UK or very different? Is there anything that stands out at all? Um, I think... Yeah, the point you know, that was really reinforced to me is that is that how strong we are in the UK in terms of the role of um, you know, TV broadcasters in film. Um, you know, we have BBC Films and we have you know, Film 4, which is the film division of Channel 4. And for many, many years, they have been a key part of the British film industry. So the three you know, um, you know, lead you know, public you know, funders in the UK are the BFI, who has you know, £24 million pounds worth of lottery money, um, you know, Film 4, which has £15 million, pounds, and BBC Films, which has you know, £12 million. Pounds, and they are you know, three gatekeepers that you know, British film producers you can go you know, to get their, their projects developed and, and their films financed. And I think that's a major difference you know, from what I've gleaned you know, this week. It certainly has been a strong theme here, and I think we keep hearing about it um, on a number of different panels. And I wonder why that is that, that certainly here broadcasters aren't finding the real market value and, and when we understand it from both sides uh, in terms of really promoting. How, how, how is it that BBC and, and Film 4 actually feel it's a good thing to invest in films? Well, I think, um, I think for both organizations, uh, it's about talent for them. I mean, obviously, they're, they're trying to acquire and fund programming you know, for their channel, but, but they are both you know, very keen you know, developers of talent. So you know, they are keen to um, encourage their you know, television talent you know, to cross over into film, um, but you know, they see the synergy there is, is important. But they you know, regard, you know, they have a public funding role, you know, they have a cultural role you know, to grow you know, British film talent. So obviously the BFI is incredibly important in this respect, but you know, you know, there were three organizations in the UK who, who um, you know, feel that that's their you know, duty. And so um, uh, it's very, very good you know, for producers because they can come to get their project developed you know, by Film 4 and by you know, the BFI. Um, and you know, both of the broadcasters you know, contribute uh, significant sums of money into film. So, you know, for example, you know, the BFI puts lottery money into, you know, in 2012, it was 31 you know, productions. Um, you know, BBC films tend to do about eight you know, productions a year, and Film 4 you know, tend to do between you know, 10 and 12. And we partner up you know, probably you know, 50, 60 percent of the films that we finance at the BFI, you know, we do with either of the broadcasters. Um, and the amount of money that the broadcasters put in, so they're contributing you know, license fees you know, to acquire UK television rights, but they're also putting in a significant amount of equity. So you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that you can go to a Film 4 or you can go to a BBC films and you could get you could get a million pounds or possibly one and a half million pounds at the upper end. And you could come to the BFI and for the same project, you could get a million pounds plus as well. So those are quite large sums of money which, uh, which could be available for the right project. I certainly heard that's a, that's a slight contrast to what we live here, but interesting because we, we in Canada know about BBC Films and we know about Film 4 because they're often acknowledged at the Academy Awards and the mm. BAFTAs and everywhere that awards are given out, and they seem to have strong executive teams that, yes, that work closely, and, and, and is, it, is it meaningful to you when a project comes to you with either Film 4 or BBC Attached? Does that give it any kind of advantage with BFI funding? Or? Well, yes, in the sense that um, yeah, there are many projects that we partner up together, but, and we have, and, and we have you know, similar tastes. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how many projects in the last you know, 12 months we have funded with each of them. Um, 
off the top of my head, I think we've probably done more with Film 4 in, in the last 12 months, but you know, we seem to have you know, similar tastes. Um, you know, BBC you know, tends to be very keen on you know, period pieces, and you know, Film 4 you know, tend to be you know, more interested in the sort of you know, slightly off the wall, um, you know, um, art house type of film. But, um, you know, we, we are you know, pleased when we um, sort of when we uh, enter into a funding um, you know, partnership with them because we know them very well. You know, we work with the, uh, we so with each other all the time, so it works extremely well. well and and uh, for those of you who think, well, it's so hard to get a broadcaster, there are films that don't get funding, that do get funding from BFI and don't get funding from the broadcasters. And I think there's a very good example you were well, talking Well, there's a very good, I mean, there's a very high profile example of that. Was uh, we, um, we put a million pounds of lottery money into the King's Speech and I think, I think it was a project which was famously passed but on by both of the broadcasters, much to their, uh, much to their annoyance in retrospect. But um, so, um, yeah, there are projects. We, I mean, at the BFI, we have, we have a, a clear obligation because it's lottery money, it's, it's open access, it's open to all. So we get, on the production side, we get, you know, we get 300 production applications a year and we're probably be and we're probably making between 25 and 30 production awards a year, so we are turning down you know 90% of the people that are you know, that are asking for funding. Um, so that you know, um, but uh, and so we have a creative team who who is charged with assessing you know, the creative strength of of the projects you know that come to us. But but we have a very wide playing field you know to serve. Yeah, which is different from the broadcasters because the broadcasters, yeah, because it's not lottery money and it's not open access, um, we have to have an we have to have an emphasis on you know, first and second time filmmakers, um, you know, regional filmmakers, you know, co-productions, um, auteur filmmakers, you know, diverse filmmakers, and so we have to have an eye on all of these areas, and, uh, and we don't have any specific quotas you know, for all of these genres, if you like, but but we will be criticized if we ignore any particular area. So that's, oh, that's quite a challenging task sometimes. I was curious as part of the, we'll get to the film forever, which unlike what's happening in a lot of countries, it seems that in the UK, the BFI is gonna have an increased budget year over year over this plan over the next five years. So kudos to, to yes. those of you who worked so hard to get, yes. to get that yes. to happen. Um, we have, um, it's interesting, in, our, in Canada, with Telefilm Canada, there's been a whole sort of revamping of the, of the guidelines for development and production. And I was curious to see with your film Forever that in the development, you've been going towards a, um, making producers accountable and responsible and empowering them through slate funding of projects to companies as opposed to individual project funding over the last few years. And that seems to be something that has been working and that you're continuing. Um, I should add that the BFI also does project funding, so you, d you have both. Yes. But maybe you could talk to us a bit about what you found in development. Um, yes, um, we spend about four million pounds a year in development, which, as, as Sandra says, is a mixture of you know, single project development. Here we make about 150 you know, development awards a year. We have about 400 applications for development funding, and as I said, we make about 150. But we also have a thing which is called a Vision Award Scheme. So we are just launching you know, the second iteration of that. Um, you know, the first Vision Award Scheme, uh, which was launched about three or four years ago, we, you know, we awarded you know, 75,000 pounds a year for each of two years to you know, 15 production companies in the UK. And, and they're very popular. You know, we give you know, these production companies a lot of autonomy. So you know, they don't have us you know, you know, breathing down their neck in terms of um, you know, trying to assess how they would spend their money so they can spend their money. If they want to hire a script editor, you know, they can use the money to do that. You know, they have a lot of autonomy and a lot of freedom to do what they want. And, we, and um, it was quite successful. Um, you know, two of the companies that, that we gave a vision award to you know, three or four years ago, you know, one of them was Seesaw Films that went on to make you know, The King's Speech and Shame. And another one was Blueprint you know, Pictures that went on to make uh, you know, the best exotic marigold to tell, and, and, and they just made seven psychopaths. So it was felt by us and also by the industry that these were successful. So we are you know, repeating the experience now. We're going to make another 15 awards of actually you know, slightly increased you know, financing. We've had a lot of applications. I won't tell you how, how many, but it's you know, considerably more than 100. And we'll be making, um, as I said, you know, 15 awards. But 
but but that's an initiative which is you know which seems to have been um, extremely welcomed by the industry. And so those companies that are that that present a business plan with a slate of projects, how do they pay the money back? Right, um, they have an obligation. Uh, they aren't obliged to put. Um, any of the Vision Award money into specific projects. So if they want to put some into development projects, as I said, if they want to put some into overhead, you know, that's fine. But, you know, they are obliged, as and when they, they start you know, producing films, they are obliged to repay in respect of each of those films, even if it's a project that you know, didn't use any of our money. But, it, but it, if it's a production you know, by you know, the awardee company, uh, they are obliged to repay and in um, a portion of of the award, and it's a maximum of twenty five thousand pounds for a film you know, costing five million pounds or more, and it's a sliding scale you know, below that. So the most that you'd have to pay for a film costing five million pounds or more so would be twenty five thousand pounds. But there's an obligation to repay it on ev every film that you put into production, and and there's no end date. So if it takes you, you know, five, six, seven years to pay it off, then yes, yeah, so be it. The award now, it was the first, the first time it was implemented, it was 75,000 pounds for a two-year period, and now that's stepping it's, up to an annual? Yes, it's, it's stepping up you know, to 100,000 pounds a year you know, for two years, you know, to 10 companies, so that's, that's 200,000 pounds, and 50,000 pounds a year you know, for each of two years you know, for five more companies. So it, oh, it's quite a sizable sum of money. And then for those companies that are emerging or newer talent or breaking into yeah. the industry, you still have a, a, a category of single project funding that you, yes. you put into the office. Yes, um, I mean, it's, and I think you might have you know, sort of indicated that, um, you know, that the recipients of the Vision Award companies sort of may have been more established companies. That's, that's absolutely not necessarily the case. Um, so for example, um, it, it will all depend on the strength of the application. But if a, you know, but if a young, you know, small company is able to establish that they have a, a particular vision, then it would, so we would be very amenable you know, to giving them an award. But almost certainly, I mean, we're keen to target you know, three specific areas um, as part of Film Forever. One is, um, is you know, some more British animation. One is more you know, um, your family films. And the other one is increased documentary. So, there is a possibility that, I mean, I don't want to preempt sort of what we'll do, but almost certainly one of the awards will go to an animation company, I would think, because that's one of the focus that we want to you know, develop. And then moving into production, it was interesting because um, I know in, in Canada there have been increasing efforts to figure out how to define success and how to reward success uh, as a means of, of trying to grow who we are as an industry and reach out further to audiences. And we've moved from defining success at the box office only to the new guidelines that Telefilm are incorporating the success across many different platforms, again, as a way to acknowledge those films and production companies that actually achieve those successes. You have an interesting component to your, to your um, production financing in this producer corridor, the producer equity investment, a way of rewarding producers who actually do achieve, and, and can you talk a bit about yes. what that is and how that? That's part well. of the new um, yeah, Film Forever yeah, five-year plan that we launched last October. We are introducing um, some, we are, we are gonna carry on doing you know, some previously implemented um, you know, development and production initiatives, and we're going to introduce some new ones. So you are really starting on the development side, we're going to introduce, and uh, uh, we're going to start it next month, we're going to recycle your know, development funding you know, back to the producer you know, that paid us back. So that's going to be a new thing, so that if, if we have a development ward and, and, and the project is converted, and we had a you know, 50,000 pound know, development ward you know, from the 1st of April, you know, that 50,000 pounds, when it gets paid you know, back to us on the first day of principal photography, instead of you know, being retained by us, it will go into a lockbox in the name of the producer whose film has gone into production, and it will be available to that producer you know, to spend on their further development. You know, so that's a new initiative. Um, we have an initiative called you know, you know, the BFI you know, Producer Corridor. And um, you know, from dollar one, a percentage of our you know, recouped income is earmarked you know, back to the producer. And, it's, and it's, it's a blended percentage rate of 37.5%. So, it starts off being 25% you know, of the money that we get back from dollar one uh, until we have recovered half of our money uh, is earmarked for the producer. 
and then you know, the second half of our recruitment, so that's from 50% to 100%, it's a 50% percentage. So overall, it's a blended percentage rate of 37.5%. And just to give you an example of that, we put a million pounds into the film, you know, The Iron Lady, which was very successful. Um, there was a 37.5% you know, um, you know, producer corridor you know, for that producer, who was called Damon Jones. Um, we got to the point where we um, had recouped our money but we had only recouped yeah, 625,000 pounds because 375,000 pounds was in a lockbox yeah, for the producer of the film, and he has already been accessing it for his further development, and, it, and in fact, he, he has fully financed a micro-budget film of 100,000 pounds in the UK. So yeah, we couldn't be more pleased for him, so, but, but this is a clear example of how we, how we are, how, so we are trying to you know, channel back you know, to British producers a, a larger share of our recouped income. This, that's interesting. So that's not you stepping back once you've recouped to a lesser equity position. This is you giving first dollar back yes. to producers. Yes. Um, so we have that initiative. We also have the initiative, which is the producer equity entitlement. So we will, so we encourage, and it's not just we, it's also the other you know, two broadcasters, encourage the producer being allowed to receive their own you know, producer equity in the film, which is equivalent, you know, you know, which is equal to the amount of the UK tax credit in the finance plan for the film. I understand you have a similar. Ours is similar, here. yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, and, um, and the next um, initiative that we're going to launch, um, it's going to be called a joint venture fund. Um, as part of the film policy review, there's a recommendation that, that an initiative you know, should be undertaken to try and bring um, UK distributors and film producers you know, closer together in some sort of you know, joint venture arrangement. So we're going to, so we're going to launch this new initiative on a trial basis initially, whereby if somebody comes to get you know, funding from us, and ordinarily our, our last reward is equity, but if they have a UK distributor who's putting up an MG for a film, you know, for their film, and it might not be at a sufficiently high level, they could say to us, "Well, look, you were going to give us a million pounds you know, for our film. We would like to treat you know, some of that million pounds as our our contribution." You know, to the UK you know, minimum guarantee. So what the producer will do is that they, they will be a, able to elect you know, to take you know, some of our money, you know, you know, to take to the UK distributor you know, to top up the MG. As a result of that, there will be a joint venture arrangement between you know, the UK distributor and the producer, which will unlock um, an earlier share of distribution revenues between the two parties. So uh, this is a brand new idea. Uh, we haven't started it yet, but you know, yeah, but people are very excited about it. You know, producers are very excited about it because it will give them an earlier taste of revenues on their films that, that is currently not available to them. And, and UK distributors are also interested because it will, it, it will reduce their upfront risk because instead of you know, putting it up in, or having to contemplate you know, putting up an MG for perhaps you know, 400,000 know, pounds, they might put up an MG for half that. Well, so that's interesting. So to be clear, the BFI will be investing in the producer who contributes yes. MG. Yes. And it may, it sounds like that might reduce what the distributor might put up. The overall MG may not change, but it'll distribute the, uh, the balance. But at the same time, the MG as it gets recouped in the normal yeah. position yes. recoups to the producer? Yes, yes, and I mean. That portion of it which is funded by. We're keen you know, not to use our you know, public money to take you know, you know, commercial money off the table. So I think this is, you know, this is more likely to lend itself to films whereby a UK distributor is perhaps a little nervous that, you know, so it, it's, I mean, it's not really going to apply to the more commercial films. It's going, to, uh, it's going to apply to the less commercial films where perhaps the UK distributor is more nervous at stepping up to the level that is required in the finance plan for the film. Because the film might be lesser known talent, for yeah. instance, yes. that you're developing, but yes. you think is rewarding. Yes. Interesting. And that's starting when? Uh, well, we're going to trial um, six films with six different producers and six different distributors. So, um, uh, it, you know, certainly by the end of this year, we'll have, you know, we'll have you know, two or three under our belt, I think, really. Now, with films like in the past, just in the recent past, The Slumdog Millionaire, you mentioned Iron Lady, King's Speech, you must do pretty well on recruitment. Uh, how big a priority is it for well, you? Well, I mean... Uh, um, our you know, recruitment target for the you know, for the BFI Film Fund is set at about you know, you know, twenty to twenty-five percent. So, as I said before, we have we have 
a responsibility to serve a very wide range of, of um, you know, British filmmaking talent. So we are, so we are investing in you know, some films that we know our recruitment is going to be nil you know, from the start, yeah, but we're doing it for other reasons. Um, yeah, but that's fine, but that's part of our role. Uh, and then we can invest in a film like The King's Speech where, so whereby we can make so many times back what our original investment is. So it's a mix of, it's a mix of recruitment, but I would say as, you know, we are sort of you know, running at what our target is, which is about you know, 20%. You know, but that's 20% across the board of the whole of the film fund, which is development, the production, and distribution. You know, the film fund looks after this, I should say, this um, you know, distribution fund. We have you know, four million pounds a year you know, for distribution, and we make you know, P&A awards to UK distributors for you know, British films, but also for um, you know, specialized film. And, and we've been doing this for four or five years. So you know, the cream of you know, foreign language films um, so, you know, uh, we make awards to UK distributors you know, that want to widen the release. So, you know, uh, we made an award to um, Amor um, a few months ago, but um, that's an important part. And, you know, and I was talking to someone the other day about this um, in Canada, and they were saying, well, why do you do that? It's, well, you know, we do it because, because we want to widen you know, the choice of films you know, for audiences in the UK. And to us, it doesn't matter that they're not British films. If, if they are an outstanding you know, Spanish film or an outstanding Japanese film, you know, we feel that it's important. Excellent. So just lastly, in your move from Polygram to the UK Film Council, how are you enjoying it at the BFI? Yes, it's great, actually. I mean, it's a very, very important time for the BFI. Um, you know, two years ago, um, you know, the UK Film Council, which was the previous um, you know, lottery film distributor, you know, it, I was closed down by the government, and they transferred you know, the lottery film obligations over to the you know, BFI. You know, the BFI is an organization which was well regarded in the UK. It's been in business for over 80 years. It does a lot of things. It you know, principally looks after the nation's film archive. But as I said, you know, two years ago, um, it had you know, bolted on you know, to it this um, you know, rather high-profile, you know, fast-moving you know, lottery film you know, distribution. So it has... Um, so you know, now the BFI is is the single um, you know, lead agency for film in the UK. So it's we call it the new BFI. I mean, it, it, um, you know, we haven't changed the name, but uh, it's very much the new BFI. Uh, it, um, it's a different animal you know, to what it was before, but it, it, um, it's a significant organisation. Which, as I said, our five-year plan that we've launched has been very well received by the industry. It has a lot of um, you know, parts to it. You're not just on the you know, production and development, but we are. But we're you're putting a lot of money into film education in the UK you know, for five to 19 year olds, and also we are um, you're going to digitise you know, 10,000 know, titles, uh, you know, film and television, um, you know, 5,000 of our own archive titles and 5,000 other titles, which we hope to make available to the public in the, in the years to come. So it's quite a wide you know, brief. Well, in a country that's brought us Harry Potter, Les Mis, uh, Slumdog Millionaire, and Andrea Arnold's Wuthering Heights, we tend to look at Britain as the colonials that we are, as, as definitely the big brother. And it's very rewarding to hear that, there, that some of the issues for young filmmakers coming out and trying to do those first films or second films, or, that there is a body like the BFI yeah. making policy to, to support that. And thanks very much for joining us in Canada. No, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>Sandra, Will, thank you very much. You know, that's, it's, it's one of the, the best things about all of this is, you know, we've got three countries sitting up here right now sharing practices, and, and when that happens, you know, you're thinking about problems you may have dealing with your own funding agency, and you suddenly go, you know, that kind of works. That's, that's really interesting, and that's, uh, that's what I think collaboration is, is all about. Um, by the way, the power of Twitter, our uh, um, discussion with Senator Dodd yesterday on um, Anne Hathaway versus Jennifer Lawrence uh, just got picked up by the, the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, it, was, it was inaccurate because I, I don't think we were really picking on Anne Hathaway. Anybody that saw Rachel getting married would know that 
she's an incredible accent, actress, and you know, it's been tormenting me because I, I really love Anne Hathaway, at least until I saw Silver Linings Playbook, and now I kind of, I kind of got a thing for Jennifer Lawrence, which I know when you, when you think it's a bit creepy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, I'd now like to introduce to you somebody who needs no introduction and is not creepy, um, and and truly loves women like no other man I know. Uh, he is a god when it comes to, I, you know, when I go to a, a party like prime time and everybody's sitting around the table uh, partying up, I follow Norm Bolin because like I know that, you know, there won't be any boring guys at the table because Norm really only allows women at his table. And like last night, I sort of had to jam in at the end of the table and just sort of sit there and get them to set me a place. And it was, it was great. Uh, Norm is the president and CEO of uh, Starlight, the Canadian movie channel to be. Um, and he's heading up this specialty channel to be uh, uh, with a, an impressive roster of Canadian producers. Um, and you know many of what uh, Norm's putting on the table have uh, some, uh, you know, I think some incredible uh, potential and opportunities for solving um, what uh, faces the feature film industry. Um, you know, as as I, I I I don't really have to uh, go through all this because then Norm's speech is up. Well, of course, then we could just do the iPad and iPod, <laughs> and we'd be done. But anyways, like Norm, why don't you come up to the stage? And I tell you what, everybody. Just to really speed things along at the end then, we'll get Norm to give away the iPad and the three uh, iPad minis because, you know, in case the application doesn't get accepted by the CRTC, at least three producers in the room will be able to say, I benefited from Starlight. So Norm, come on up. Hi, I guess I can do the walking around thing too, eh? It's cool. Uh, I want to thank Michael for paying a tribute to my animal magnetism <laughs> uh, on Women's Day, International Women's Day. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be honored. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mark Sagan. Thank you, Anne Truman. Thank you, all the team at CMPA for making this such a successful again, event again. Congratulations to all of you for having this. Starlight, there you go. Uh, the last time I was on this podium, I thought would be the last time forever that I would be on this podium because I was stepping down as the president and CEO of this organization. And here, I find myself here again. When I was a kid, uh, growing up in Saskatchewan, I really liked cowboy movies. And this experience of being back on the stage today makes me think of one of my favorite lines from a cowboy movie, and that is, I just got to know how to quit you. I don't know how to quit you. And it, for some reason, I can't quit this place. It's strange. My daughter does reality therapy on me. She says, Dad, your retirements are a dime a dozen. <laughs> and she's right. I keep getting seduced back into this industry. And why? Because there are interesting projects to work on. And Starlight's such a project for me. It's um, something that fits me. It fills a gap in Canada's broadcasting system, and it fits the CMPA too, because it stands for what the Broadcasting Act stands for, and that's putting Canadian content first. I'm gonna tell you about a few highlights of Starlight. It's a very brief, whoops, very brief presentation. And uh, first thing I'll tell you is we have an application in front of the CRTC. Uh, we filed the application in June. We just had an outpouring of uh, supportive uh, interventions from many people in this room. And we're now going into the final stages of preparing for the hearing, which will take place in April. At that time, we will go before the commission and make our case. And uh, it'll be a very combative experience. Those of you who saw the Lantos uh, Pam Dinsmore session yesterday will know that there are many differences of opinion about this. It's very polarizing, and it's something that's going to be quite engaging. People are telling me they're already lining up to get tickets for this. Um, in recognition of this, I'm, when we get the license, uh, when I'm going to create a new series. It's going to be a nightly series hosted by Robert Lantos and Pam Dinsmore. Uh, and I think it could really work. 
These are the people behind Starlight, uh, some of the most distinguished filmmakers and distributors in the country, and I'm very proud to be working with them. Uh, and I've found, since I've gone into this role, that um, these people are incredibly passionate about Starlight. And you'll see that when I show the video later. They are getting behind this because they believe it fills an important need in our system, and I agree with that. You know, the CMPA's successful push for new CanCone rules, uh, rules in the group licensing uh, proceedings last couple years had a major impact on our industry. And we're seeing something of a renaissance in Canadian drama production. In fact, the drama business in Canada is thriving. But the same cannot be said for feature films, despite years of intense lobbying by the CMPA and by others. Most Western countries, we just heard about the UK, which was very interesting, really have rules in place to require broadcasters to support domestic feature film. Canada doesn't. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, the UK broadcasters have significant regular broadcast slots in prime time for their feature films. Canadian broadcasters don't. I, I believe that Canadian feature films have become virtual orphans in our broadcasting system. You'll hear people argue that that's not the case, but the data shows otherwise. Global, CTV, and City do not run Canadian theatrical feature films at all. Over a seven-year period, 2004 to 2011, Canadian theatrical features on relevant English specialty services, and I've re removed services like Hustler and Playboy and stuff like that because I don't consider them to be relevant specialty services, have declined from 3.3% to 1% of the schedules. That's a significant decline. Even more telling, on our movie channels, the pay TV premium channels, we've seen a decline from 13% to 5.2% of schedule. Those are the latest figures that we could get. Now, commercial broadcasters have their own reasons for this, and, and I'm not challenging that. I was a broadcaster, and I understand it is extremely difficult to market and promote feature films. Why is that? Because they're one-offs. It's much easier to market, promote, and publicize episodic, long-running series. If you've got a series that runs for four or five years, you've built up incredible brand equity. There's, the people know what they're watching. They tune in for it. It becomes a regular part of their viewing lives. But to take a feature film, particularly a Canadian feature film, which has very limited theatrical release and doesn't get the kind of buzz that big American blockbuster films get, it's very, very hard to pull an audience to that, and it's very expensive. So the broadcasters have moved away from that. Broadcasters have also said to me and to others that Canadians don't really want to watch feature films, and I believe there's a bit of a tautology there. If you're not marketing and promoting and scheduling Canadian feature films, it's very hard for people to get very excited about them. Um, and I think broadcasters used to say people weren't very much interested in Canadian drama either, uh, and that it was a bit of a lost cause for them, and they had to focus more on foreign programming. When the CRTC changed the rules for conventional television recently, and required them to spend on programming of national interest and schedule it in prime time, we saw a huge, huge impact. We saw a renaissance because people are being exposed to more drama, it's being promoted more appropriately, it's been advertised more appropriately, it's being scheduled more appropriately, and that's paid off big time, not only in terms of domestic viewing of our films, but international as well, which is one of the things we are all concerned about and everybody's been concerned about here at this conference. So again, to the issue of what do Canadians want to watch. So we, we, we did our own studies, but Heritage did a study. 90% of respondents agreed that Canadians should have access to Canadian feature films. 73% of the respondents in that CRTC study said that Canadian broadcasters should show more, show more Canadian feature films on television. People prefer to watch film on television more than they do in the theaters. That's what they say. And we did our own study, and around 65% of the Canadians we surveyed, and it was done by an arm's length organization, said they would be willing to pay 90 cents a month for a Canadian movie channel. Now, Starlight is asking for a fee of 45 cents a month. That would be our wholesale fee. The cable companies and the satellite companies typically would mark that up to 90 cents a month. So that's why we asked the survey question that way. But it's not absolutely necessary that the cable companies take 100% markup. 
on our channel if they choose to do otherwise. Starlight will be a home for Canadian features. Starlight is designed to make an exceptional contribution to the broadcasting system. And that's the high bar that we have to uh, jump over in order to satisfy the CRTC. We're applying for a special kind of license. It's, a, it's called a 91H, which means it's a mandatory carriage license and a, it's a mandatory wholesale fee license. If we are successful in getting this license, we will automatically have around 9 million subscribers, and we will be guaranteed an income stream of 45 cents a month from every one of those subscribers. And we'll have a seven-year license. And that gives us uh, um, a stability that no uh, channel that features Canadian film has ever had. We will be 100% Canadian content. I don't think we can do better than that on that particular exceptional contribution. We will be feature films, feature documentaries in prime time, no commercials in those films and, and documentaries. MOWs, miniseries, and programs about films and filmmakers. But in prime time, it's essentially feature films and feature documentaries. And we will invest 70% of our revenues in Canadian content expenditures, which is the highest of any channel. So these, these are the reasons why we believe we're going to make an exceptional contribution to the Canadian broadcasting system. Basic cable. Now, this issue of accessibility. Canadians finance the production of feature film through telefilm and tax credits and other mechanisms. They have paid a lot of well, hard-earned tax dollars to help finance these films, but they rarely have a chance to see them. If you live outside of a major center, uh, you're never going to see a Canadian film in a theater. There are just too few screens. And you're going to have very little exposure, as I've said before, on, on uh, television. It will bring needed programming diversity to the Canadian broadcasting system. One of the things we're going to do is we are going to not only run English Canadian, English language films in English Canada, we're going to run all the Quebec films as well, and we're going to subtitle them, and we're going to make them available to the rest of Canada for the first time, really. Most of those films have never been seen here and never had an opportunity to be appreciated in the English system. The huge legacy of French and English films, we will draw from that. There's more than 3,100 theatrical features and 300 documentary features available that we have identified already. And we're, over the term of our license, we will invest $200 million in the acquisition, financing, and licensing of Canadian programming. That's $200 million new dollars into the system. And this is, a, we think, a one-time historic opportunity. We don't believe that 91H proceedings uh, looking for licenses uh, that fit the 91H category are going to come along very often, if ever again. So this is a historic opportunity for us to find a mechanism to address the long-standing feature film funding problem that the CMPA has been so concerned about for so long and has argued about. We're going to fully, we talked, we heard in, uh, in the, the presentation from the British Film Institute about uh, the way they finance films. We're going to fully finance 8 to 12 theatrical features a year. That will be part of our new original content every year. And our model is to finance those films uh, net of federal tax credits, but we're going to let the producers keep their provincial tax credits and keep them out of the financing. And that's a pretty revolutionary idea in, in our system. Those tax credits were, and the CMPA has argued this as well, those tax credits were put in place to help independent producers capitalize their businesses. And we know there's a lack of capitalization in our industry. It's one of the huge issues that face our, our companies. We are going to ensure that the producers who are financed by us will keep those provincial tax credits and use them to capitalize their businesses and grow their businesses. And we have had many discussions with the CMPA since we put in our original application. When we put in our original application, we did not have an intention of uh, doing additional licensing. We were going to stick to the 8 to 12 theatrical features fully financed. But we've been convinced by the CMPA, and I think it's partly informed by my experience as a broadcaster, that we need to do more than that. So we're also going to step up and provide premium license fees for additional feature productions. Normal license fees in the range of three to 300,000 to 500,000, typical of what uh, pay TV has put in in the past and has been doing less of. Oh, this is where we play the video. Um, 
This is a video we uh, put together for an event we had around the Screen Awards the other day. It was very gratifying to see the Screen Awards pull such a big audience on CBC relative to what was expected. And I think the blending of film and television in one award ceremony was a great idea. We had a brunch uh, for supporters of Starlight uh, as part of the Screen Awards, and we made this video for that, and we made it for this event, and I hope you like it. Oh, sorry, there was another slide. Only independent producers will be able to apply to the fund. Uh, uh, for theatrical feature films and documentaries. That was another thing. We never originally were going to do feature documentaries, and we were convinced by the doc organization that we should open that up to feature documentaries, and so we have. And one of the big challenges, uh, people have said, well, isn't this just, uh, you know, Robert Lantos and Neve Fishman and all those guys are setting this up and, so that they can just have all the money and use it for themselves, and that was one of the biggest criticisms that was made. We're committing that none of the investors in Starlight, including all those filmmaker investors, will be eligible to produce for the fund. And they're not, they're gonna be frozen out of that fund. So it's not a self-serving uh, application in that sense. And this is something that I could hardly be a hypocrite on this since <laughs> I negotiated with my colleagues at the CMPA the terms of trade agreement with the commercial broadcasters and so it's a value I believe in. It's something I, I think is very important to our industry, and I, I'm committed to negotiating a terms of trade agreement with the CMPA, and one that won't do anything to erode the existing agreement, which has a most favored nations clause in it. And we know that's a fundamental principle for the CMPA. Now, I think we can play the video. Canadian film is first and foremost an expression of our identity through the most important medium of our time. It's always been a struggle to make sure that Canadians are aware of their own film culture. Je pense, et c'est particulièrement vrai au Canada anglais, qu'il y a un immense réservoir de films que très peu de gens ont vu. There have been some 3,000 Canadian films made in English and French over the last 60 years. They collectively represent a significant portion of the cultural legacy of this country. Our purpose is to make them available and accessible in every home, 24-7. Canadian feature films are really orphans in our broadcasting system. There's very little place for them. There's been a uh, huge inertia in terms of Canadian broadcasting vis-a-vis -vis Canadian filmmaking. There's no place on the dial right now where you can go, I'm going to see what Canadian fiction writers and filmmakers are, are doing. We're going to give these films a home. The question becomes how do we actually distinguish ourselves and define ourselves to ourselves? And I think it comes out of the arts and one of the big components of that is filmmaking. On a developed an industry that is mature, that has a talent recognized in the world entier. Notre cinéma international, ils sont parfois plus appréciés et plus connus à l'international qu'à l'intérieur de leur propre territoire. Some of the top filmmakers in Canada are backing this channel and investing in it to make it happen because they believe in it. They are all people whose lives have been intertwined with making films in Canada that are competitive worldwide. We make different kinds of films, but we are all in the same boat when it comes to our excitement about the Starlight concept. I think that really says something about how much has been missing in terms of Canadian television. I think we're at a point, uh, collectively, where we're prepared to try and use our reputations to protect, enshrine, celebrate, archive, and present this culture to a public. Seventy percent of every dollar that Starlight receives goes into the acquisition of Canadian films or the production of new Canadian films. Once the theatrical release has run its course, the movies that will come out of this, which we think will be between eight and twelve a year, will premiere on Starlight and will be our original program. Starlight will be on basic cable, and that means that anyone 
who has cable or satellite in Canada will have access to these Canadian films. I think for any Canadian, this is, a, this is incredible value. They're going to get this whole world of cinema, which is both historical and contemporary and looking to the future. This one channel is dependable. You will go to it, and every time you go to it, every day, every hour of every day, you know there's going to be something there for you to watch. And it's something that you're going to want to see because it is talking to you about your own country. It's a bargain. It's really something that needs to be done. The key to more success for Canadian film is to make those films accessible to mass audiences. That will create much more interest and support for Canadian film and recognition of its quality, which is very high. I think it's a very culturally significant channel that we should have in our dial. Les gens vont découvrir une extrême richesse de, de, de films. C'est une opportunité pour le public d'avoir accès au talent, autant du Québec que du Canada avoir accès à leurs films sur Starlight et qui vont voir leurs films, ils vont les aimer. I think the idea of the channel is timely and utterly necessary. It's very forward looking, very futuristic and very exciting. If the world makes sense, this channel happens that there will be a new wave of Canadian film. It's a very unique uh, opportunity that we have and I think that's why so many of us are behind this project. The relevance of our programming is such that it is actually of national importance. It is part and parcel of the fabric of a country. So I think you can see why I'm excited about this idea. I think it's a bold idea. I think it's a controversial idea. I think it's an innovative idea. It's an idea that we need to examine very carefully, and I hope it's an idea that we will bring to fruition. I hope next year, God forbid, I'm going to be on this stage again. But when I'm on this stage next year, I hope that I'm here to announce what our guidelines are for the licensing and funding of Canadian feature films for Starlight, which we hope to launch by the middle of next year. Thank you for your time. iPads. Steven, we got to get Steven up. You're going to pick some. Sure. <coughs> okay, so we need Steven Ellis. One last go at it. So, Norm, just to sum what you said, if there's no place to find our heritage, there's no compass to build a future from. Something like that? Yeah, something like I'll that. I'll write that for you by the time we get to the hearing. How's that? It's a great idea, you know, it is a, it is a great idea. I was looking at, at so many of those films and they gave me uh, flashbacks, some of them because they were in the 70s. Um, but they gave me flashbacks as to just, you know, memories, little, little things that you forget because they are not, you know, whatever anybody else is saying, they are not on the dial. Okay, cut the bullshit, we have, it's time for the iPad. Okay, let's go. Wow, there's a lot of them in there. Carol Cooper, Canadian Retransmission Collective. Is she here? No, they're the sponsor, actually. Not here, they're the sponsor, okay. <laughs> Carla Bobadilla, Behind the Scenes Services. Is Carla here? Okay, too bad for Carla. <laughs> Angela Heck from Tactica. Is Angela here? I, I saw Angela around, no? Yeah, there here she we is. Go. Okay. Let me just pull another one while we're going. We need, what do we need for? Okay. Sandra Richmond. Stone Hay. That's it. Jordy Randall, 724. Is Jordy here? Angela's first, I guess she gets the iPad. Here we go. Pardon? What about Mark Thompson, CBC? Okay. Mark, don't, don't get up anyways. Uh, no terms of trade, no iPod. Uh, oh. no, no. Patrick Waugh? 
By the way, Sandra is a two-time winner. She won last year as well. I want to know what she's doing right. <laughs> Stephen Stone, Catherine Tate. I can't believe those people were my friends. I would have thought they would have stayed for my presentation. jean Viev Menard. jean Viev, I thought I was talking to you earlier. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. What are we doing? Stephen Waddell. Stephen, you still here? Actor National. He signed an agreement. Not CBC, though. What about John Wakeley? Yell if you're getting. Jessamine Nunez. Dave Bigelow. This is funny. Eh? I know Robin Mursky's gone. Marcus Handman. Anya Lahiri. Next year they're giving away a car. <laughs> Donna Zuk. Donna Zuklinski. Oh, we got her. How are we doing? Is that the last one? <laughs> on up, Donna. So, oh, that's too bad. The last one was Lisa Clarkson, CBC, but we're out of, we're out of iPods. Jeez. That was really mean, you know, I, I, but that, that was Mary Sexton who said, you know, boy, you gotta kick it up a bit. You gotta kick it up a bit. I was bored at lunch. Bored, silly. <laughs> okay, we're really, we really are close to the end. Um, but, you know, I really have to, like, a lot of people said how great this is, right? And it really is great. And there's a, there's a lot of our, our team at CMPA that have been working on this. Um, at least I hope they have, because that's, Mark has explained to me, uh, that's why I haven't seen any of them around for the last six months. But, you know, it's going to be really neat meeting my team in the office environment afterwards. So, anyways, Mark Sagan, of course, who's still here. Natalia, I got it. You know, incredible. You can tell her any time now, it is International Women's Day, and I think, you know, having a daughter on International Women's Day would be something that you know you you would truly deserve and cherish for the rest of your life. But if it's tomorrow, like we all wish you the best. Um, Lisa Morrow, who actually runs primetime. Um, Ann Truman, Sorolta Cheta, Priya Rao from outside, who I've worked with with Banth and who really put together all the speakers here. Thank you, Priya. All the hot talks guys, guys. Guys, like the guys like Jen on International Women's Day. I'm sorry, I apologize. All the hot docs gang, Jen and Adam. Edith Landerville, my assistant. Thank you, Edith. Angela Tupper. And last but not least, I think we all should give a big hand to the didgeridoo guy, our regulatory man, Jay Thompson. So, so one of the things I have to do right at the end of this is uh, um, you do the wrap up of all the sessions we've been to, and you know three or four bullets for each and every sessions, and uh, you know well no that's true isn't it? Well like in Britain they uh, what do they call that? Yeah, yeah. So so but we're not going to quite do that. But but so a couple of thoughts that did strike me, and, and I'll, I'll go through them really quickly, and by that I mean really quickly. So. I think number one, right, global, you know, if, if we look, it really is more than glass half full and it's, you know, global demand uh, really does mean global opportunities and that presents opportunities to partner. We talked a lot about internationally, but I think we have to think across platforms to the people that are working, you know, from, from software um, to uh, new platforms and as, as it was suggested yesterday, particularly mobile. Number two, you know, the demand for video is insatiable as it is unlimited, uh, but I think the packaging and presentation is, is changing, so we have to adapt the skills. And to me, that means that mentoring has really become interactive in the sense of it's, it's two ways, because I think the younger generation 
um, has as much to mentor um, a lot of the traditional producers as the traditional producers have to give to them. Um, so government gets it. I mean, it's really great to hear, and it's not just in this country, but in many worlds, that, that governments really do understand that, um, that uh, uh, film and TV and online video in total is critical, not just to your heritage, but to economic development and to global competitiveness and, and a future for our children. And that, you know, that is, is really big, so they get it. It's too bad that they finally got it just as they ran out of money, but you know, nothing works perfectly in this world. So, you know, and the other message I think from the CRTC chair is we can help you a certain way, right? We can take you part way down the path, but at the end of the day, uh, it still starts with the story and the talent to deliver that story. And, and I think, you know, increasingly, uh, as we all know, it's going to be the audience that determines what gets created. And what we learned uh, in one of the sessions today is the audience is going to help tell the commissioner what gets created even before it has been developed. And they're going to do that through big data and analytics. And that's why this is all a new world, but uh, you know, what a huge opportunity. All we've got to do is change everything. You know, it's a line. It's like a line from Fire Sign Theater, who some of you may not know, and probably healthier for it. But you know, everything you know is wrong, um, and you know that's part one. And part two is how can you be in two places at once when you're not anywhere at all? Uh, if you figure all that out, then we've got the model for the success. Okay. So for, lastly, um, well, second, lastly, I really want to thank the rest of our sponsors for their support. It's a long list, but you know, I really want to take the time to make sure each of them know that, that we valued their sponsorship too. Uh, so our bronze sponsors are ACTRA, Alberta Film, The Bell Fund, BFL Canada Risk and Insurance Services, Canada Film Capital, the CBC, the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association, Cineplex, the Canadian Retransmission Collective, the Directors Guild of Ontario, Entertainment Partners Canada, Epitome Pictures, GPAC Entertainment, National Bank, Ontario Media Development Corporation, On Screen Manitoba, Panavision Canada, Playback Magazine, Premier Bobine, Real One, Entertainment, PS Production Services, Royal Bank of Canada, 724 Films, and Technicolor. And our support sponsors are ACTA Toronto, the Capitol Hill Group, Cinespace, Film Studios, Crestview Strategy, Fillion, Wakelead, Thorup, Angoletti, LP, Yahtzee Canada, the Independent Production Fund, International Institute of Communications, Manitoba Film and Music, Newfoundland and Labrador Film Development Corporation, Rogers Group of Funds, RTR Media, Strategy Corp, Super Channel, and finally the Writers Guild of Canada. And that's where the ideas always start with the writers. So I know all of you have a whole bunch of trains and planes and automobiles to catch. Half of them have already been canceled by the storm outside. Um, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you're from Toronto. You know what happens. Um, so, uh, I, you know, thank you for ascending. Uh, and uh, circle March 5th to 7th, 2014 in your calendars for next year's calendars. Have a safe trip home. And for me, my first prime time, like, I met so many cool people over the last three days that, uh, you know, I really want to thank you. And I want to, I, I, I'm so happy I got to know so many of you. So, um, Let's do this again soon. Thank you very much, and, and thank you to the team. What a huge success.